All right, so welcome. Thank you everyone so much for joining us and spending some time with us today. Um, this is a community call um, hosted by the ORCID US community, which is a um, the ORCID consortium for nonprofit organizations in the United States. Um, so we do, for those who may not be familiar, the ORCID US community does community calls on various topics throughout the year. Um, and this is our first one for 2023. So welcome back into the new year. Um, so the topic that we're going to be covering today is institutional repository usage statistics, otherwise known as IRIS, nice acronym. Um, and we're, so we're going to learn about IRIS. And specifically, we're going to hear also about how IRIS works with both ORCID and DOIs. Um, so we've got some nice flower acronyms there, IRIS and ORCID. Um, just a few welcoming notes. We do have an agenda and notes document um, that's being linked in the chat, so feel free to go in to that agenda document and add your name to the list of attendees. Also, your microphone is muted for now. Um, so feel free to put things into the chat if you have questions or comments, but um, we will have some time a little bit later in the call where everyone will be able to unmute and also turn on your video. Um, so stay tuned for that because we're looking forward to having some discussion and questions um, a little bit later, but we will be um, sharing the recording of this after this session, and we'll we'll share the slides as well. Um, and you should be able to enable closed captions if you'd like to have that. Um, let's see. Um, also, just a quick note about our community norms. Um, we have a code of conduct, which is linked in our agenda document, but essentially this is um, designed to be a safe space where we can engage in respectful discussion. So feel free to ask questions, seek clarification, be receptive to feedback from others, um, and, you know, generally be a respectful person in this space. So a few introductions. Um, my name is Sheila Raven. I'm the program leader for Persistent Identifier Communities at Lyricis, which is the organization that leads the ORCID US community. Um, so I manage the ORCID US community. And we also have a data site consortium for, for DOI. So I manage that as well. Um, my colleague, Paolo Guhilde, our ORCID US community specialist, is also on the call with us. Um, so we are the ORCID US community staff. And our guest speaker today is our colleague, uh, Hannah Rosen, um, our strategist for our content and scholarly communication initiatives. And Hannah has been working with IRIS and will be telling us all about IRIS today. Um, and so with that, our agenda, we're just going to talk about what is IRIS, how does IRIS work with ORCID, how does IRIS work with DOIs, and what else do we need to know about IRIS, and then, like I mentioned, there will be time for discussion and questions after we hear from Hannah. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Hannah to tell us more about IRIS. Thank you so much, Sheila. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, excellent. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to speak at this uh, presentation today. I did want to make the flower acronym joke, but Sheila took it from me. So unfortunately, I have no joke to introduce my wonderful presentation to you. I guess happy almost Groundhog Day. But I'm here to talk to you about IRIS, Institutional Repository Usage Statistics. Um, and as Sheila just said, we also had the same agenda card, so we're doing great. So let's start with 
what is IRIS? So IRIS is a usage statistics aggregation subscription service enabling institutional repositories of various shapes and sizes to share and expose usage statistics down to the individual item level. Um, what really makes IRIS stand out, it was developed by developers at JISC, which is the national consortium in Great Britain, but actually most of the developers of IRIS are on the counter, um, basically board of directors. So it is based on the global counter standard, which is currently R5, and they are constantly updating to make everything as compliant as possible. IRIS collects raw download data from your institutional repository, basically all of the data that your institutional repository is collecting, and it processes that data into counterconformant statistics. I say counterconformant because everything that can be countercompliant is countercompliant, but there are certain things that counter has not created tried and true statistics for such as data sets. So they try and make it as conformant as possible to the standards that are available. So how does IRIS work? Basically, it gathers data from your institutional repository, basically use code to activate the institutional repository software so that it sends raw data to the JISC team. It's sent to their special IRIS server. It's then processed into counterconformance statistics. Then it is presented on screen, usually via sort of searchable reports. There are a couple of data visualizations. And if you want to export that information, you can export CSVs, TSVs. There's a SUSHI compatibility and there's a widget that can be embedded into your repository. So this is what it looks like. I'm actually going to switch to the actual site so I can show you in real time. So I hope there isn't too much of a lag. Let me go here. Oops. Nope, that was still my slide. That was too realistic. So I need to, let's do this. Here we go, okay. All right, so this is the IRIS website, and I'm actually going to put a link to it in the chat. Um, because anyone can go to the IRIS website. This is what makes it really unique. It's a totally open statistical aggregation platform. So any stakeholder can go to this, any stranger can go to this. The point is that you, this information Everyone who is involved with either materials within your institutional repository or funders of materials in your institutional repository can see the statistics. Now, IRIS started out um, basically with sort of two main ways to look at a repository's performance. If you go to this report and there's a custom platform report and that allows you to look up the performance on the whole of a of the repository. So we actually have a small repository, um, you know, of our organization's research output. So I can actually put us in, and you can see here, our repository is Lyricist Research. I'll put the start date for, let's say October. And then there are sort of parameters you can look at. You can look at item types, like to select all. And then there are the sort of the two counter um, categories, which is investigations and requests. Investigations are sort of new to R5. Investigation is when someone sort of lands on the page and a request is when they open the document. So investigation is investigating, just sort of looking around and a request is when they say, okay, I actually wanna use this resource and they have total requests and unique requests. So I'll just say, I want unique requests and I can generate a report. And then it just shows down here in the platform, basically the total number of requests for my whole repository, but not just as the full repository, you can also go to the items. And this allows you to see 
basically usage for all of the items in your repository. And it will show all of the items in your repository, but it'll be filtered the way you want it to be filtered. So say most searched items, you know, going down to least search items. But you can see here, I didn't have to log in or anything. I can look myself up. You can look these up. I encourage you to play around with it while I'm presenting because I know we all have short presentation attention spans. But let's just say I only want to look at December of last year for my repository and I want to see unique item requests and unique item investigations. I'll generate my report and now you can start to see that sort of all the search terms are on top, but down here are the results. So we can see which ones basically had the most going down to the least. As I said, we have a very small repository, so please don't judge us. And sir, all of your repos repositories are beautifully robust and have tons and tons of views. We are very, very tiny. But it is a good illustration. You can see the item type, you can see the metric type, and you can also see here that we can export any of these statistics and it gives you CSV, TSV, JSON. And as I said, there is a sushi light functionality and there's a widget that can be embedded into your repository. So that's just a very, very brief, here's Iris, here's what it does. It's pretty self-explanatory. The real work is happening on the back end to make the statistics as clean as possible so that you really understand what the usage is for the content in your repository. I'm just gonna hop back to the PowerPoint again. I do apologize for all the switching back and forth. All right, so what's really nice about the openness of IRIS is that it really benefits many different stakeholders. For a repository manager, you can get a local picture of you know, how many people are using your institutional repository. You can even look globally to see which countries are, you know, which researchers from which countries are looking at your materials. And there is actually a capability in IRIS, although we don't have enough institutions in the US yet, but we're hoping to build them up to do national benchmarking. You can actually compare repository usage between your repository and any others that are within uh, IRIS that are subscribers. And that's really wonderful. But also the nice thing is any of your researchers, if they have materials, in the institutional repository, they can look up usage of their works themselves, and they can use the, the statistics to demonstrate the impact of research and dissemination activities. For funders and policymakers, they can demonstrate the impact of research funding. They can see, you know, here's how many people have viewed this research that was funded by X organization, and they can see it sort of across different repositories. And this isn't really relevant for this presentation, but certain service providers actually do use IRIS for their statistics, uh, the big ones being CORE, which is based in England, and OAPEN, which is actually fairly international. So I know what everyone wants to know is, how does IRIS work with ORCID? Well, it's not a direct integration because that, that wouldn't really make sense with the service. But basically what IRIS can do is it can pull any ORCID information from your repository uh, and it can be used for search functionality in the software. So if you think back to when I was playing around three minutes ago in the IRIS website, you can see that there is actually a new report. This is fairly new last year called Item Statistics by ORCID. So if ORCID IDs are input into the repository, IRIS can pull those IDs and you can actually search by individual researchers. So say you have an institutional repository, you know a researcher has, I don't know, 20 plus different articles or even five plus different articles. 
and they want to know basically all the usage or someone wants to know all the usage for that particular author, you can actually look them up by their ORCID ID. Now, the metadata field depends on the repository because Iris works with many different repository softwares, but it's usually the equivalent of a Dublin Core metadata term. Uh, in the case of our repository, which is a DSpace repository, we did DC Creator. And basically the Iris team will work with you to figure out which field you're using for ORCID so that they can do, basically they can crosswalk that to their own system. And they actually even provide guidelines for identifier discovery on their website. I put a link on this page, but these slides will be distributed afterwards. So never fear. So you can see here, this is actually a screenshot on the back end of our Lyricist Research Repository. As I said, it is a DSpace repository. And here I put this DC Creator field that is my ORCID ID. You know, nothing stokes the ego quite like using your own ORCID ID in a presentation. But you can see I just put that value in. And now when I go to, oops, when I go to item statistics by ORCID, I actually just put in my full ORCID ID into the search bar. I hit update report and you can see that five different reports came up with my ORCID ID and you can see all of the unique item requests for my ID. And actually you can see in the middle, there's a little box that says, says who the author is, Rose and H, that's me, my ORCID ID number. So it links directly to my ORCID page and the number of items known to Iris. So theoretically, if a researcher had materials in multiple repositories, but their ORCID ID was entered by each of those repositories, Iris would show that across those repositories. It would say, you know, lyricist research and, you know, let's say I was in University of Michigan's Deep Blue, it would show me in both of those repositories. So it's really using the power of the metadata provided by basically whoever is running that institutional repository to use ORCID as a search mechanism. How does IRIS work with DOIs? It's pretty much very similar. So if DOIs are input into the repository, IRIS can pull those IDs and search by the individual item. And as I said, the metadata field depends on the repository, but it is usually the equivalent of a Dublin Core relation or a Dublin Core identifier. And if Dublin Core isn't used in the repository, just can be informed when you sign up, oh, we use this field for DOI, and then they'll make sure to pull that as the fields. This is, you know, they work with you. It's not just a robot. It's not... It's more human than say Google Analytics. So they're making sure they're constantly updating their scripts to make sure that they're removing as many bots as possible to make sure they're getting the right information from your repository. And they, just like with ORCID, they provide guidelines for identifier discovery. So I hope what you're getting here is that they're very transparent about all the processes used to run IRIS and use to maximize IRIS for your own needs. So this is also a new report last year. It's called the Individual Item Report. And once again, this is a screenshot from our repository. And you can see we use the DC identifier DOI metadata field. And I have put in, you know, Lyricist is a member of the Lyricist data site community. So I made my DOI in the Fabrica site and then I put it into the repository. And now when I go to the individual item report, I can look up by item ID and I can look up that DOI and it brings up and I can choose which metrics I want for that DOI as well. So I could choose the total item investigations, the total item requests, or the unique item investigations or unique item requests. 
And you can see it actually lists out, you know, the item title and the author. You can actually see under the author that my ORCID ID and my colleague's ORCID ID are also listed. So this is all sort of tied together in IRIS. And then we can look at basically the reporting. I had this is for unique item requests and I was going from July through December. And you can export this report as well. So this is really great sort of this, the granular level that these ORCID and DOI search functions, they really allow you to look at the impact of research either by an individual or for a particular project. And as I said, for all the different stakeholders that there are, each of them has an advantage just being able to say, okay, I'm gonna give you the DOI and you can look it up and you can see exactly what you want. And whether it's a funder or individual researcher or an institutional repository manager, each of them can go in and search by these different methods and get really wonderful data. So I know you're all thinking this sounds beautiful and magical and I want to know all the things about how to do it. Well, that's what this section is. IRIS is currently compatible with the repository softwares listed here, DSpace, ePrints, Equella, Esploro, Figshare, Haplo, Pure Portal, Samvera, and WorkTribe. If you have basically a platform that you have developed in-house, they can map to basically the metadata fields. All your repository has to do is be able to transmit data to the IRIS server. So we actually worked with an individual research repository called Vivli. They created, for example, they basically created their own repository and we were able to help them get the information they needed over to IRIS. So if you've created your own, that's not an impediment. There are certain hosted softwares that have not built in um, compatibility such as DPress, for example. So unfortunately, you know, we try and get every hosted repository software to work with Iris. Many wonderful ones do, some don't. So that's why we have this page. I don't want to break anyone's hearts. These are the ones that we know have built-in integrations. How to participate. It's a pretty cheap service. I'm just going to put that out there. Lyricist is the U.S. national distributor for IRIS. So anyone within the United States who wants to purchase IRIS, um, it's basically a yearly subscription fee of $1,500 for one repository, $750 for each additional repository. We've already negotiated a central license agreement. In terms of installation, basically what happens is you as the repository manager install a tracker that basically allows your repository to send information to the IRIS team. They confirm that they have received your information. And then once they make sure everything's running smoothly, the statistics are available within four weeks of installation. As the national distributor, we do not charge until we get confirmation from the IRIS team that the data has gone through. We've we learned our lesson from that in the past and we want to make sure that everything runs smoothly before you commit any money. And that's basically it. Um, I've put my email on here. I'll put my email in the chat, but we should have plenty of time for questions. And I think I saw some stuff in the chat. So I will stop sharing my screen and then and let the questions begin. Great, thank you, Hannah. I'm just making it so that people can unmute and start video if you want to. We do have a few questions that came into the chat, so I'm just gonna go in order. Um, let's see. Um, the first one is, does IRIS do normalization of ORCIDs and DOIs when they map the original repository values into their database? 
Um, so I guess depending on the repository, some people are including an ORCID ID as like the full URL versus just the ORCID number. And same thing for DOIs. There are like standard best practices for how to display ORCID IDs and DOIs, but there could be a variety of, of ways that those values are displayed in, um, in repositories. So does IRIS capture all of those different formats and standardize them, or how does that work? So IRIS expect, uh, accepts basically either way. Um, I actually learned this from my own experience in the repository. Their guidelines actually outline what they believe is best practice, and okay. they don't do the whole URL for ORCID IDs or DOIs, but they accept them regardless. So okay. basically, whatever your repository is doing, they just need to know the field where okay. those those are being in. Put it, that's more important to them and they'll just display whatever you have put okay great um the next question is just a confirmation if if someone is using b press for their repository they would not be able to use iris is that correct that is unfortunately correct and that's a question we've gotten many times yeah. and I believe you have also gotten that many times Sheila about yes yes unfortunately B press I mean even if you could use iris with B press B press doesn't have an integration with orchid so it's not really set up to include orchid IDs um, and they don't have integrations with any of the DOI providers either. So B press is kind of a, just a challenging one for any of these types of organizations. I will say for anyone who is using B press, the best thing that you can do as a customer is to just be relentless in terms of asking B press to integrate with these um, with these other open infrastructures because. Right now, B-Press is kind of getting left behind in terms of some of these best practices. So, um, so yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> B-Press is not um, going to be able to work with this, but hopefully they will make improvements and they will eventually. Um, um, okay, some more questions. Uh, we didn't see Dataverse on the list. Do Dataverse repositories support IRIS? Uh, they are not currently at this time. We haven't had any okay. discussions with Dataverse, but we would certainly okay. be happy to reach out to the Dataverse reps and see if there is a possibility for an integration. I can actually see in the chat, uh, have we worked with TIND repositories also no, but the same yeah. same response applies. You know, the the Iris team and, and Lyricist, you know, just just to be clear, I'm sort of representing them, you know, I'm talking on behalf of the Iris team. Lyricist is not running Iris. Basically, we partner with JISC to provide Iris to any US potential subscribers, but they are open to working with anyone um you know the issue is not disinterest on the part of the iris team they will work with any repository software they can um, but it does take a little bit of development time on the part of those repository software developers so that's that's the bigger obstacle and i'm just looking down there's okay great that's good to know so i would say if if anyone is using a repository software that doesn't support Iris currently, and you're interested in, in using Iris and you want your um, repository to support it, would it be the best uh, thing to do to contact you, Hannah, um, or, or reach out to us and we can, you know, start those conversations and see if that's something that we can make happen? Yeah, that'd be great. Yes, and I've put my email in the chat. Um, so Matthew asked, great. outside of downloads and views, is there any work to track reuse and citations? There isn't at this time. I mean, you're 
It's a valid question wondering what the value add is here beyond what we can pull from what information the repository platforms may already provide. I would say mm -hmm. the value proposition is that, you know, this platform is probably the closest you can get to counter compliance statistics. You know, most repository platforms do provide statistics. Many of them are not counter compliant. Some of them say they are, but the documentation is a little bit non-existent. Um, so you just have to take their word for it. I believe these are the cleanest statistics you could possibly get. But also I would say the openness of the platform is one of the real value propositions. You know, if you are running a repository, yes, you can look up the statistics, but your funders cannot, your researchers cannot. And, you know, if that is valuable to you in terms of presenting usage to multiple stakeholders, this is a really transparent and wonderful way to do that. Um, Lady asked, is there an API that other systems and interfaces could use to query and display the data in IRIS? There is an API. Uh, I believe you have to be a subscriber to access it, but I'm not sure about that. So let me look it up. I can actually send you the links. Um, there's a link to the API that I can put in the chat so you can just see what is available. So Larissa said, uh, what is the benefit of counter compliance? So counter compliance is basically a way of, it's a global standard for measuring usage statistics. Actually, basically almost every single major publisher in the world uses them. And they define what counts as real usage. They tell you what exclusions need to be applied to make sure bad agents aren't included, to make sure um, basically bots are not included in the usage statistics. They basically, it's sort of the most cleaned up statistical standards that you can have for checking usage for any materials, whether it's institutional repository, whether it's um, so green OA, gold OA, diamond OA, non OA, um, basically any content, scholarly content can be measured against this counter standard. And they are working on data sets. They don't have a counter standard just yet for data sets, but it is in progress. And you're welcome. And thank you, Paolo. He put a link into projectcounter.org. And there's actually a great comment in here from Sadie. I can imagine another benefit if a bunch of repositories contribute to IRIS is that your researchers could see a fuller picture of their repository usage stats, since with so many co-authors, a lot of times the same work might be in multiple repositories. That is exactly right. Actually, IRIS started out in the UK, and actually a majority of UK institutions use IRIS for their institutional repository, UK academic institutions. And so it creates a beautiful national picture for them. And researchers can look, you know, the repositories can compare with each other. The idea originally was that the repositories, you, you know, you could see who else has the same kinds of specializations that you do, see how other people are performing, see how researchers are working across repositories. All of that is actually built in. For the US right now, we don't have enough adoption yet because, you know, Within the US, there are so many different kinds of repository softwares, it's not as easy, but it doesn't mean it isn't possible. So it's, it is certainly our hope that eventually we will get to a point of adoption where different repositories can be compared or people's works can be seen across repositories to get that fuller picture of research activity.
So Paige asked, is there documentation anywhere for configuring or installing the IRIS counter in the repositories that are supported? Yes, there is. So there is actually, there is all the documentation you could ever want is on the IRIS page. There's an implementation. Basically, you have to install this tracker. Um, you know, once you say, yes, I want to be part of this, you install the tracker. It's usually about a half page of code. It's not, it, it's not burdensome. Oh, you found it. Yes, I was just about to put that link in the chat. But it goes through for every single um, software that they have, and it tells you what you need to do in order to implement IRIS. And I will say, I know for DSpace specifically, if you are an Atmire client, they can just turn it on for you. So you don't have to do anything. You just have to let them know that you want to implement IRIS and they will do it for you. You mean turn it on. You still have to pay through Lyricist, but Atmire will do the, the software tracker implementation for you. Sheila, you are muted. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a community <laughs> call without at least one person trying to speak while muted. Um, of course, it had to be me. Uh, these are a lot of great questions. Um, we still have plenty of time for more questions and also comments. Um, everyone should be able to unmute and turn on your video too if you want to if you want to do it that way but we can also continue um in the, you know looking at the chat as well um one thing while people are letting this sink in a little bit um we do have a blog about specifically ORCID and repositories. I'm gonna put that link in the chat. Um, so, you know, if you're wanting to use Iris, um, if you're wanting to be able to search based on ORCID ID in your Iris stats, you'll need to make sure you have ORCID IDs included in your repository to begin with. So it's kind of like taking a step back. Um, so, you know, there are best practices for um, getting ORCID IDs into your repository. This blog kind of outlines what those best practices are and then gives a few examples. Um, so similar to Iris, um, not not every repository software is integrated with ORCID. It kind of depends on what repository software you're using. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of first step, um, I would recommend just looking at the blog. And of course, you can always contact myself and Paolo for questions specifically about the ORCID piece. Um, Wendy, did you answer the API question? Hannah, there is an API, yes. um, but I yep. think we got the link to it, but then I think we got sidetracked on a different topic. So do you want to talk a bit more about the API? For uh, Iris? Yeah, I mean, the API, you know, is accessible to subscribers and, you know, you can use it to basically run reports from Iris. There is additional custom content. I can't really say anything that isn't already on the site I linked to, but yes, yes, there is an API. And I think we may have, well, we lost you there for a second, Sheila, but you're back. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, any other questions, any other thoughts about this? Um, I guess I, I would be curious, um, you know, I guess on the DOI side, um, it's a similar thing, like some, some uh, repository platforms already have an integration with Crossref or Datasite for assigning DOIs to materials in your repository, or for example, if you're a Datasite member and you're 
creating DOIs um, through the data site Fabrica uh, form. You can just take those DOIs and, you know, pop them into the metadata with your repository items. Um, I, I guess my curiosity for this group is, um, you know, does Iris sound like something you're interested in, something that would be useful? And also like the lookup by ORCID and lookup by DOIs, is that something that that um, would be useful too? And are, are people including DOIs on, on their repository content? Um, I think we, we already have somewhat of a good idea of like who has ORCID integrations with their repositories because me and Paolo help with all of that, but, um, but we don't always have a, a good clear picture of um, is everybody using DOIs in their repositories or not? And would these features be, be helpful and useful? I would love to just hear comments if anyone has thoughts on that, but also if, if there are more questions, feel free to ask those too. I know this is a lot to take in. <laughs> oh, we're seeing some uh, responses in the chat, Sheila. Great, yeah, that's that's helpful because you know everyone everyone kind of does it differently. DOIs for some things, but maybe not for others. Um, nice, good to know. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Well, if you're not using DOIs in your repository <laughs> and you want to assign DOIs to things, <laughs> Uh, you're welcome to join our data site consortium. Um, let me put mine and Paolo's email address in the chat. Um, you know, if you're interested in, you know, using data site DOIs in your repository and you're not already doing it, contact us. If you're interested in integrating ORCID IDs into your repository, contact us. Um, and of course, for any questions about Iris, you can send them to that email too, and we'll forward it over to Hannah because Hannah is our Iris expert. And we're all on the same team. It's not, it's not hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will um, say it was, it was very yeah. satisfying to get these, uh, these new features in Iris um, just because it was sort of, it call it, you know, all these services that allows us to actually work with them all together. You know, we had Iris and we had a DSpace repository and kept seeing all the amazing work that Sheila and Paolo were doing. And finally, to be able to link them all together, it was so, you know, the power of these tools is immense by themselves, but when they start to interoperate, that's when they really get exciting. And that was just really cool for us. And we do, I mean, the, the use case for us that I had been thinking about a lot was that we do this thing called the Catalyst Fund at Lyricist. We have our own small fund and we do grants for half a dozen projects every year. And one of the requirements is that they have to do a white paper that goes into our repository. And now when they submit their white paper, we can hand them the DOI and they can just check the usage throughout the year and they can see, you know, how much interest there was in their work. And that was really great because otherwise we didn't have an easy way of telling them, you know, we use a DSpace repository. DSpace does have usage statistics, but they're not standardized. And so this was a nice way to say, okay, you know, Here's what the usage is. It's the same kind of statistics you might see with any other resource that you might purchase. It just lends this air of credibility. So we really enjoyed that. 
Um, I see a question. It says, how about handle support? Um, I don't think that Iris does do, I don't, I don't think it reports out handles, unfortunately. Um, and I will shut up in a second, but all I'll say is the beauty of Iris is you can play around. So I'll, I'll put the link in the chat again, but if you, you can just look at any aspect of the site that you want because it's open. And so you don't have to take my word for it. You can just play. So yes, yeah, so what, what Wendy said in the chat, if you use their ORCID ID, they can check all their work and not each item. Exactly, exactly. See, you're catching on. The possibilities are exciting. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, more efficient, Matthew, definitely. I need to get one of my works into one of these repositories so I can look myself up. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left on this call. If anybody does want to stick around and ask more questions or continue to discuss, um, it could be anything related to iris but also orchid and dois too we can kind of you know address any of anything that you might be wondering about or would love to hear you know if anybody is um yeah just we'd love to hear anything that that you all have to say so feel free to pipe up or continue pasting in the chat Or if you need to go and get onto your next call and get on with your day, that's fine too. We're so thankful that you joined us today. Hopefully this call was helpful. And thank you to Hannah for being our first presenter of 2023 and kicking off the new year for us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Great. Thank, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for spending time with us. Have a great rest of your day. And of course, don't hesitate to contact us if any questions come up further. <laughs> but yeah, we can we can certainly stay on uh, a little longer to continue conversation. Hi, Bonnie. Mine has nothing to do with because our um, well repository, our, our portal we have from here is private, so there's no right. going out from there. Um, but I actually was going to follow up on the little um, email back and forth with Shauna yesterday that you were coming okay yeah I saw that yeah so, <laughs> so um so this whole orchid science CD integration thing is